Hello and welcome everyone. This is guest stream number 53.1 at the Active Inference Institute. It's August 23rd, 2023. We're going to be having a presentation followed by a discussion around the recent work of Alexei Tolchinsky, A Case for Chaos Theory Inclusion in Neuropsychoanalytic Modeling. So if you're watching live, please feel free to add any questions into the live chat. Otherwise, we will now have the presentation followed by a discussion with our excellent panelists. So thank you everybody for joining and Alexi to you for the presentation. Um, thank you, uh, Daniel. Um, thank you, Mark, for finding the time. I'm very uh, grateful and excited to talk about this. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, Bryn, Albert, I hope maybe Mike will join us. And uh, thank you, Daniel and Active Inference Institute for organizing this meeting. So uh, can you see the slides? Yeah, okay. So I'll just uh, proceed then. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is the outline of the talk. I'll share some preliminary comments and uh, talk briefly about assumptions in the current models, summarize the data talk about free energy principle formulations as compatible with chaos and talk about uh, some future developments. And hopefully we can discuss that. I'm very much looking forward to have more questions than answers. Um, I'd like to start with what Michael Levin uh, taught me, I guess, is just why it's important. <laughs> uh, to me, the most important thing is the clinical applications. I uh, think that with your work, Mark, and with Yak Pangsip's work, we have been moving uh, away from dualism uh, over the course of some time, but I think the other big de determinism is still highly prevalent and dominant. And I do think it influences our uh, clinical work, diagnosis and psychotherapy and assessments. And I think that it may be beneficial for some of the harder conditions we work with to consider including nonlinear uh, framework. That's my main focus. Uh, this is the link to the preprint, and the paper is published fully in Neuropsychoanalysis Journal. <clears throat> Some of it is a uh, discussion with this foundational paper uh, that you, Mark, wrote, the new project for a scientific psychology general scheme, which is a uh, perhaps revision, uh, a revival of Freud's famous paper, Project for Scientific Psychology. Uh, and um, I'd like to give you credit, Mark, that you have been opening conversations between disciplines that hadn't been talking to each other prior to your efforts, such as psychoanalysis and uh, neurosciences. Uh, you've been doing it for more than 20 years with great success. In the same spirit, I wanted to mention that Society for Chaos Theory in Psychology uh, exists since 91, which is when their first conference happened, uh, about less than 20 years and then the first conference on chaos in Lake Italy, uh, around Lake Italy in um, Lake Como in Italy in uh, 76, which was mostly physicists at that time, and then psychologists joined. And I've attended the recent conference in Toronto, which was absolutely wonderful, and I met extraordinary clinicians and scientists, and uh, I think that it would be beneficial to open that dialogue as well, and maybe if there is a wall between us to consider demolishing the wall. <laughs> um, um, uh, in terms of intent for the paper, you, Mark, pointed out to me that you've had an exchange with Robert Gallitzer Levy. Uh, for those of you who may not know him, he's a psychoanalyst from Chicago, a psychoanalytic writer and uh, teacher who wrote a book on nonlinear psychoanalysis and deserve, deserves a lot of credit for his advocacy and, you know, he's sharing his thoughts. He posed a question to you, Mark, of uh, possibly considering nonlinear components in that uh, seminal paper you wrote, Project for Scientific Psychology, and to which you responded that the key point in such discussion was whether the mental apparatus was indeed nonlinear. So I took your comment as a task, as a uh, challenge, if you wish, and decided to write a paper about it. I don't know if the data presented is sufficient, but I tried. And very clearly, I don't intend to contradict or criticize, uh, you know, that would be funny of me to do. I am hopeful, maybe, to add a branch on this tree that you're growing, clinical and theoretical tree, and should you uh, consider it worthwhile to go in this direction, we wouldn't have to change very much, because this is the paper by Friston, Lancelot, DeCosta, and others called Stochastic Chaos and Mark of Blankets. 
uh, free energy principle is compatible with the uh, uh, chaotic attracting set. What I thought was not present just yet was a formulation where the attracting set experiences a phase transition. And I uh, took liberty to ask Carl about it, and he shared some very nice thoughts that I will, uh, with his permission, share at the end of the talk. Um, I'd like to cite Maxwell Ramstead, whom you know, and his colleagues from the paper on Bayesian Mechanics of Physics Often by Beliefs, where they talk about dynamics, mechanics, and principles. And in physics, uh, you know, Kepler's work uh, is descriptive. It shows, you know, what the orbits of heavenly bodies are. Mechanics are uh, the how of the uh, dynamics. This is Newton's laws. And principles are prescriptive. They are about why things work this way. There's a certain hierarchy in physics where you could derive the second law of Newton from principle of least action. And if then if you have initial conditions, you could calculate the dynamics. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning that is I think, Mark, your new project for scientific psychology is a high road. It seems to start from first principles, such as the free energy principle, and then you seem to derive things down from there. So I thought, why not try to see how the low road may look like if in addition to these derivations and deductions and declaration of what entropy should be in the brain, what if we measure it in animal studies and human studies in health and pathology and see what the data shows and whether or not the low road meets the high road in the middle or perhaps something may need to be added. Um, I also like to clarify why I spend time in the paper talking about obvious things for everybody here, the axioms and postulates. And um, I'm quoting here, Edward Frankel, who is a mathematician at Berkeley. And, you know, uh, Michael will forgive me, but, you know, uh, a viewpoint is that uh, one can say that some parts of biology can be seen as based on chemistry, which can be seen as based on physics, which can be seen as based on mathematics. So how do things work in mathematics? We know that Carl Friston likes to translate nearly everything he works uh, on into the language of mathematics. Classically, there's something called a formal system which we can metaphorically compare to building a house. So the foundation of the house is a set of axioms that has certain qualities. And then we build things up using the logic of Aristotle and we derive things like theorems. An example would be Euclidean geometry, which is on the plane that is based on five axioms of Euclid. That's the foundation. And then you could derive things like Pythagorean theorem. Now, if we were to change just one of the axioms in the foundation, the entire house changes. An example would be the fifth axiom of Euclid, that parallel lines essentially don't intersect. If you change that, then we could have a house of on the sphere, which is lobachevsky riemann geometry, and the radians on the Earth are parallel and they intersect. Or you could have parabolic shape, where parallel lines also intersect. So we'll have an entirely different framework. And it may be naive to expect the theorem to look the same. The Pythagorean theorem, if we, you know, put it on the sphere, is different. The formula is different. Um, I'm mentioning that is because I, I love multidisciplinarity and I think that's the way of the future. With that, sometimes when when we cross over into another discipline, such as you know, psychologists, you know, taking mathematicals or physics ideas, then we we may occasionally forget this formal system thing. For example, when we say things like human beings resist or violate the second law of thermodynamics, then we uh, the second law was formulated for closed systems in the state of equilibrium, such as a sealed chamber of gas. And human beings are neither closed nor in the state of equilibrium. So it doesn't quite apply. It's a different formal system. One needs physics of open systems to make a statement like that. So again, in mathematics, because you, Mark, seem to have taken us deeply in the domain of mathematics in your project, you have differential equations for action, perception, precision. You have, you know, Markov blankets, random dynamical systems, you know, equivalences, partial derivatives. Then in mathematics, people fix the set of axioms, they fix the definitions, and then they build the theory, right? Um, so I want to be clear, I want to clarify what are the axioms in the theory that is built? What is the foundation? And uh, in the effort of time, maybe I'll talk about just one of them, uh, which is Freud's psychic determinism. And this is a question for me, not an answer. I wanted to ask you, because I'm assuming 
uh, whether you uh, kept this axiom or you changed it. So Freud said in the psychopathology of everyday life that there is nothing arbitrary or undetermined in the psychic life. There's different versions of this statement, and it has been repeated by generations of psychoanalysts over 100 years, and it became very entrenched. It's sort of a cultural meme and a major tenet of psychoanalysis. Um, if I were to give an illustration, perhaps, for those of us who are not in, in uh, psychoanalytic therapy, then let's imagine an analytic therapist hearing a patient who intends to say same with an S, but they use the word shame, right? So such a phenomenon, you know, first of all, I think psychodynamic psychoanalytic therapists would, would probably say that's not an accident, okay? Accident is, is not, not a, you know, used term in psychoanalysis. And secondly, they will probably infer of what it might mean. For example, infer along the lines of unconscious or uh, emotional dynamics, emotional conflict. Somebody else may infer that it may have neuro neuropsychological reasons. Somebody else may infer that it probably is a migraine. But what you might will not hear in psychodynamic culture is that that was you know, an accident, that it was due to chance. I think that chance, accidents, randomness, stochasticity, chaos are not used. They're bad form in psychoanalysis. And that, that is the illustration of, I think, for its assumption. Ultimately, it's, a, it's an axiom. It's a belief that is not questioned. If we were to translate that assumption in the uh, Friston language, this is the Langevin equation from which Friston starts, which is uh, has notations by Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, we have the change in the state of X equals the flow uh, plus the omega. Omega is the stochastic component. It's the, uh, you know, in Daniel's metaphor, we have a wave and then we have ripple. So we would have to change the stochastic component if we were to go with the Freud's axiom. And then if we do that, we would find ourselves squarely in the domain of cold physics, Newtonian physics, Laplace's demon. Laplace famously said, give me a position and momentum of every particle, and I'll tell you exactly where they have been before and exactly where they will be in the future. Now, Freud didn't make statements like that, but this is what would happen if you kill the stochastic component. Uh, I want to be clear that it's not for its fault at all. Well, first of all, you need axioms to build a theory. He chose that axiom. That's the theory he built. And second of all, it wasn't exactly mathematics. And, and finally, the zeitgeist of the time was deterministic. You know, perhaps there were, uh, you know, initial derivations of stochastic mechanics and quantum mechanics. But Freud, when he was learning, the world of deterministic physics was dominant. And uh, there's an important nuance in this discussion pointed out to me by the first peer reviewer of the paper, who said, you know, listen, if you have something that changes, like a stochastic thing, and then you apply statistics to it, such as variance, then the variance of a changing variable will be deterministic. And then if we look at things like words, which are used a lot in talk therapy, like apple, an apple is a semantic memory, it's a category. It's a coarse graining already from green apples and red apples and all other kinds of apples. So in that regard, words are deterministic things. So perhaps when we have a dream analysis session and the patient shares with an analyst, you know, the movie that they saw, the messy, you know, irrational thing with images and tunes and anything, and maybe words even, if they narrate it, then they, they slow things down, they average things out, and they put it in deterministic tools, which is words. So with some objects, we can apply deterministic tools. But I want to point, point out that, that the foundation that everything and anything in the psychic life, that all the mentations have no stochasticity randomness, is a very strong assumption. And I'm curious what would happen if we were to allow ourselves to see things on the sphere or on the parabolic shape. It's not a bad exercise because the... Uh, general theory of relativity would not have existed between without these other geometries. Uh, in terms of uh, definitions, this is a familiar formula that you mark use of Shannon's entropy. He originally wrote about telegraph and a sender and receiver in a fixed alphabet. But here, if we draw an attracting set, which happens to be a Lorenz attractor in phase space, and we look at these, I don't know if you can see them, they're small, the white points, you know, uh, that's the initial condition. And then they spread out and evolve as time goes by. But you can see the density of the attracting set. It is a high, higher density and lower density. So we could calculate 
probability distribution. Uh, a, a slightly different question is this. What would happen if you were to change the initial condition a little bit, one, one millimeter in phase space? Different things can happen, and one of them is shown in this diagram. That would be divergence. And the formula here is initial condition multiplied by exponent of lambda t. So when lambda is positive, you have uh, divergence. And it's called Lyapunov of exponent, and that's one of the criteria for chaos. When it is negative, we have convergence. And when it is zero, we have equidistant trajectories. We have Newtonian mechanics. Right? Um, this is a, an illustration of a chaotic system, which is a great red spot on Jupiter. And it fits perfectly the Friston's paper about the Markov blankets and stochastic chaos because that thing is stable. We have been observing it for 300 years. And one could say that this elliptical shape is the Markov blanket around the chaos that maintains its integrity. It's not a contradiction because in one spatial scale you have Markov blanket and on another spatial scale you have a chaos within the Markov blanket. This is a convergent system that is a bit trivial to all of you. This is a hole in the ground and then surrounded by hills on all sides. And if you were to put a ball on the hill, it's going to roll down in the potential well. And typically in phase space, we we'll call the bottom of the hole an attractor and we we'll call the hills repeller. Repeller is a term uh, less frequently used, uh, but you know it's the highly unstable point in phase space from which things move away from and they move toward the attractor. Now, that's just one attractor. The interesting things start happening if you've got two of them. Imagine a second hole immediately to the right. And the boundary between them may very quickly become chaotic. Okay? Here's another illustration on a convergent system from the Active Inference textbook that I hadn't read when I was working on the paper. I discovered it later. Uh, the chart on the left <clears throat> is the density. And again, we see high density in the center, and we have lower density in the periphery. And the chart on the right is surprise. We're very not surprised to find a ball in the center, and we're very much surprised if it stays on the hill. And I'll, I'll read you a citation. Active inference is restricted to systems like that one on the left, which count to random fluctuations with their average flow and thereby retain their form over time. It may sound like the statement contradicts what I said earlier, that FEP is compatible with chaos. But it doesn't, because you could have different spatial scales and convergence on one scale and divergence on another. I also historically think that we have been studying converging systems mostly so far. Now, if we move from things like that, which is very simple, to a mind or consciousness, then I think that what we could be looking at is this. That's a landscape with attractors and repellers that is very complex. And I'm going to quote the former president of the Chaos Society for Psychology, is that that landscape is dynamic. It moves. Uh, perhaps some things on it are stable. If we were imagine a clinical scenario where there's a patient who is very prone to shame and very averse to express anger, then we could say that shame is an attractor and anger is a repeller. But and we work with pattern things in dynamic therapy, so they could be relatively stable until the work in therapy makes them more shallow uh, distributions. But certain things change overnight. Some things change in a week or during the course of therapy. So, I mean, strictly speaking, that's a dynamic landscape. And I don't think we model things this way. Um, I'd like to also quote Maxwell Ramstead from the same paper, that free energy principle is a tale of two densities. It would be incomplete to say that we just minimize one variable. You know, uh, what happens is we minimize the Shannon's entropy of probability distribution over sensory states, while at the same time we maximize entropy of internal beliefs, which is very important. That's adaptation. If somebody has rigid internal beliefs uh, with sharp probabilities and then COVID happens, they will have lower probability of survival. Um, they're not adaptable. So adaptability means maximization of entropy of internal beliefs while maintaining the four means, the minimization of Shannon's entropy of probability distribution over sensory states. Uh, here's another term, kolmogorov sinai entropy, that is not intuitive, and uh, it's from topology. Uh, the picture you see is the photograph of the statue called Intuition outside the Fields Institute of Mathematics in Toronto. Uh, here's a graphical illustration. If you were to draw the trajectories in phase space, and surrounded by a certain volume, say a circle with the radius epsilon, 
and ask yourself what happens to this volume as they evolve. Well, when when the when it expands, then you can have chaoticity. When it uh, uh, becomes more compact, you can have convergence. When it stays the same, you have periodic system, which is indicated on the chart on the right, where you have a, you know a correlate of the kolmogorov sinai entropy on the y-axis, and you have this epsilon on the x-axis. So the flat line at the bottom, where the the circle doesn't change, is the periodic system. kolmogorov sinai entropy stays zero. The curved line in the center that converges on a k is the proper chaos. This is um, theoretical chaos. And the upshoots from it uh, is, is what Friston calls stochastic chaos. This is chaos plus noise. And then you can have pure noise. And then you can have pure linearity. So all of these things exist. They're all on the table. You can have geometry on the plane, geometry on the sphere, geometry in the parabolic shape. So what does the data show? And uh, when we look at EEG uh, entropy, People use approximate entropy, permutation entropy, and spectrum entropy, which are all derivations of Kolmogorov Sinai. And the first two are in different phase space from the last one. I believe, Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, you cite Gosiris, uh, a study in your book, Hidden Spring, when you talk about entropy and phases of sleep. And they use spectrum entropy, which is a derivation of Kolmogorov Sinai in the uh, frequency domain analysis phase space. So the data shows that, you know, uh, systems for as small as an axon of a squid isolated in the lab to single neurons, to coupled neurons, to EEG, we have evidence of positive Lapinov of, of exponents in some regimes of operation. With EEG, we can be more specific that alpha rhythm seems to be weakly nonlinear, uh, while things below alpha like delta seem to be more periodic with noise, and things above alpha, such as gamma and high gamma, seem to be chaotic. So if we were to summarize this data, then it would uh, uh, be, uh, we can say that kolmogorov sinai entropy appears to increase as generalized arousal increases from delta to gamma rhythm. Uh, kolmogorov sinai entropy seems to be higher in healthy alert brain-mind functioning than in the states of coma, seizure, or deep sleep, and it can stay close to zero in a coma or deep sleep. The interesting anecdote here is that a simple act of closing your eyes when you're alert decreases kolmogorov sinai entropy. Clinical applications are uh, vast and developing fast. For example, but except for clinical psychology, I must say, and, and psychiatry and psychotherapy. But in neurology, the seizure detection on the EEG uh, is right now can be done with AI with about the same accuracy as a human neurologist. And that algorithm does use uh, chaoticity assessment. There's models for Parkinson's neuropathic pain and I have other examples that I'll skip for right now. This is a graphical illustration of phases of sleep. And uh, uh, again, it has Kolmogorov sinai entropy as a phase of sleep. It shows wakefulness and then shallow sleep, progressively deeper sleep in REM, and that's the time evolution. If you move REM in frequency to where it belongs to wakefulness, then you'll see the same progression that kolmogorov sinai entropy appears to increase as a function of generalized arousal. This is uh, seizure onset at about second four. Seizure is a reduction in chaoticity. Healthy functioning is higher chaoticity than a seizure. Uh, this is a coma, which is relatively invariant theta and delta frequency. Is a nearly periodic system with some noise, and death is a linear system, it doesn't change. This is persistent vegetative state, minimally conscious state, where researchers were asking a question on prognosis of survival, and they've concluded that diversity and variability of the EEG was the predictor of survival. Higher entropy means life. Um, so the uh, hypothesis is that chaotic, stochastic, and linear processes, as well as hybrid ones, such as primarily chaotic functioning with noise, can be present concurrently at different scales of the brain-mind, uh, or the same scale but in different places or at different times. I realize it's a mouthful, but it fits the data uh, presented in the paper. This is, again, a picture uh, from the textbook on FTO inference by uh, uh, Thomas Parr, Carl Friston, and Giovanni Pizzullo, it's a cortical column, and uh, the errors you see here are uh, ascending and descending connections. If by chance you're not familiar with the framework, they correspond to uh, uh, the ascending errors are prediction errors and descending ones are predictions. This is what they say in the book, that there's an asymmetry in message passing, and the reason for that is that the operations required to compute prediction error 
from expectation are nonlinear. This nonlinearity is due to computation of predictions using nonlinear functions that tend to increase the frequency of the signal. I'd like to talk a little bit about reduction. It became very fashionable and sometimes silly to, you know, use this like, oh, you're reductionist. No, you're reductionist. And the second most popular term is oversimplify. You oversimplify. No, you oversimplify. And to me, they're not bad words. Uh, they're necessary tools to simplify and to reduce. Uh, you know, the map that equals the territory exactly is useless. Nobody's going to use it. It must kind of, I'm quoting James Glick, simplify and abstract. But, you know, I'll illustrate the, the specific term. If the car is moving with a fixed velocity on a straight line, and if I know exactly where it is right now, I can tell with certainty where it has been an hour before. That is a reduction in time. And I can do that because the formula is linear. It's distance equals velocity multiplied by time, and velocity is constant. If the watch is broken and I disassemble it and I find a faulty part, and then I put it back together, uh, and it works, uh, then it's a reduction in space. And I can do that because watch is not an end colony, uh, to use Daniel's terms. Watch is uh, equal to the collection of its parts. So I wanted to talk about, Mark, your uh, mention of the predictive hierarchy composed of billions of homeostats in your, in your work. This is approximate picture. This is not the exact picture of what you talk about in the new project. And this is from your hidden spring. It's a predictive hierarchy where predictions flow from left to right and prediction errors from right to left. And uh, one of the statements in the book, in the hidden spring, you say that brain's many complex functions really can ultimately be reduced to a few simple mechanisms like this. So it appears that you, you know, uh, you call it reduction. But I just wanted, it is a powerful model. It is a flexible model. I wanted to describe some features of it. Well, first of all, if homeostat is present at every single scale, then we have this homogeneity of mechanism throughout the scales. And I want to say that in physics, things don't look this way. Quantum mechanics is the microphysics. Statistical mechanics is molecular level. Newtonian mechanics is heavenly bodies. And then we have general theory of relativity. There's qualitative shifts. There isn't a homogeneity of mechanism all the way throughout. In fact, when people say take entanglement and they apply it to human beings, that's sort of a misunderstanding of entanglement. Uh, the second comment is from Mike Levin, who talks about the scales. And if, you know, his comment is that, that you could have different functional spaces at every scale, where you could solve a genetic task on one scale, electrochemical on another, morphological on a third one. And then how you do message passing, what is the common language, is not a trivial question. Along the same lines, I've already mentioned that a message between the scales can be nonlinear if you do prediction errors. Now, if you take one nonlinear message and then you multiply it by billions, you're going to have a full on turbulence, which is a chaotic system. It's a uh, dynamical system. And turbulence you cannot reduce to homeostat or anything else. You know, saying that water consists of H2O does not explain turbulence. So I don't know, that's an open question, but I wanted to maybe share some perceptions of this uh, model. This I talked about, uh, and this is the Friston's thought about phase transition and the attracting set. Uh, he said that if you have a hierarchy of Lorenz attractors, a slower one and a faster one, and a slower one governing the transitions of the faster Lorenz attractor, then, then you could have a FEP formulation with the attracting set experiencing changes and transitions. And that's brilliant, I think, and it matches the anatomy because the brainstem and the subcortical structures appear to be slower Lorenz attractor that could be seen as governing the transitions of the cortex, which is an astral Lorenz attractor. I know I'm oversimplifying things a great deal, but it, it sort of, this is his thoughts. I think him and Lancelot de Costa are working on that. Perhaps Maxwell Ramstead's group is working on that as well. The clinical applications, the landscape that I've mentioned before would be absolutely lovely to see if we were to consider going there. Uh, borderline personality disorder, or another term for that could be complex trauma, the metaphor that we use for these patients is they're predictably unpredictable, that the only thing we know on Wednesday that we don't know what's going to come up, suggesting chaoticity. Acute trauma has a symptom of hyperarousal, suggesting possibly higher level of chaoticity. An onset of mania can be seen as a transition into a higher energy state, and addictions, particularly with stimulants, can be seen as phase transitions into a chaotic state. 
It may sound like what I said now is contradictory to the, what I said before when I suggested that, you know, lower chaoticity could be a problem, such as an onset of a seizure. And here I'm saying higher chaoticity can be a problem. But that would only be a contradiction in the linear world. In the real world, where linear is very small percentage of what's happening, uh, I'm saying both, that too little and too much chaos could be a problem. Just enough chaos in balance could be perfectly fine. This is a graphical illustration of what can be done. And this is from my colleague and friend, David Pincus, who is a professor in Chapman University, and I think also a former president of the Society for Chaos and Psychology Society. These are trees, and may sound like completely unrelated to what we do, except if you look at a human lung or a dendrites in a neuron. Uh, and you can see a healthy tree on the uh, right from me and a nearly dead tree on the left. And if you do the fractal uh, assessment, fractal dimension assessment on them by counting the thickness of branches and count the number of branches at each level, then you can quantify it. And then you can have approximate quantification of health and resilience versus, you know, pathology. And uh, again, as exotic as it may sound, this is very similar to what people do when they detect a seizure on the AG. They measure CD, correlational dimension, which is approximately fractal dimension. And I think my 30 minutes are up. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Lexi. Great presentation. Well, looking forward to this discussion. First, Mark, please feel free to add your reflections. Then, Andrea, then we'll continue on. Thanks very much. Um, I, when uh, Alexi asked me if I would join this uh, panel, uh, the first thing that I said to him was yes, uh, coupled with the second thing being, but please be aware that I know next to nothing about chaos theory. So, you know, I'm not sure uh, 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 how much uh, uh, of a contribution I can make to a technical discussion um, of this kind. Uh, so I'm, I'm just repeating that uh, before I say anything else. If I say anything that sounds amateur, that sounds as if uh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about when it comes to chaos theory, it's because I'm an amateur and I don't know what I'm talking about when it comes to chaos theory. That said, um, the second thing I want to say is I'm not entirely sure what is at stake uh, here. You know, it seems as if uh, Alexei feels that it's really important that um, that I and uh, our colleagues uh, get our head around chaos theory and bring um, some of its um, what it has to offer uh, into our field. Um, because I don't know uh, much about it, I don't know what's at stake. You see, I don't know uh, why that's important. So, uh, um, you know, perhaps somewhere along the line in the next uh, just less than an hour that we have, perhaps, uh, Alexi, you can clarify that for us. Um, the third thing I wanted to say is, um, and perhaps in order to illustrate the first thing, uh, is that as Alexi was talking now, it seemed as if he was talking about chaos as if it were synonymous with stochasticity. Or, or randomness. Uh, and that's not my understanding, uh, my very limited understanding of chaos theory was that it's not a synonymous, chaos as used in that, um, uh, in that uh, science or in that uh, theory um, is not synonymous with, with randomness. It's rather synonymous with unpredictability. Um, it, because we don't know uh, the initial conditions of the system, or we can't specify all the variables uh, with sufficient precision uh, in their initial conditions, it becomes impossible to predict. Um, and, and because of the nature of the interrelationships of the variables, one tiny little um, error in your estimation of the initial conditions can lead to massive consequences. And this is why uh, it's so hard uh, to predict. Uh, chaotic systems. So if that is what is meant, then I would say, um, sure, of course, this applies to the way that the mind works and the way that the brain works. Um, but that leads me back to my second point. I'm not sure what's at stake, but I would say if that's what you're asking, 
if that's what you're claiming, rather, uh, Alexi, then I would say that that surely must be so, that it is exceedingly difficult uh, to predict um, mental uh, and neural events at any level uh, of complexity. Um, now, uh, I think I've said three things. So, uh, let me now say a fourth thing. Um, I think that a crucial, um, well, let me put it this way. Uh, of course, what the brain and mind are trying to do, um, it, it's a matter of trying to predict what's going to happen. So when I, what I've just said about how, how difficult it is uh, to predict what's going to happen in the brain or mind, uh, it's, 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 it's almost the same thing as to say uh, that the, the mind and brain are trying to model the world. Uh, that's that's the main thing that we're trying to do is 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 uh, have a good model of the world so that we can uh, get some sort of grip uh, on this chaos um, so that we can uh, act rationally in the sense that we can act um, in order to preserve ourselves uh, that we do not dissipate. Uh, be, uh, by uh, just uh, exploring all possible states and and uh, no longer existing as a system because we as systems need to remain within certain bounds across a great many variables as you said um we can't afford to just let shit happen and you know and throw ourselves uh, 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 to its uh, to 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 its fates uh, we need to try to predict uh, in a very unpredictable world, uh, what must I do in order to meet this need, given how the world works? So the brain is trying to model the world. Uh, our predictive model uh, is 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 trying to synchronize itself with the world, and for that reason, it's going to be uh, very chaotic. Um, but the crucial point is, it's trying to reduce uh, the unpredictability. Um, with that said, uh, I'll make a fifth point, or maybe it's another part of my fourth point. No, I think it's a fifth point, which is that the way that I conceptualize the predictive model, uh, and it's not me alone who does this, uh, is that it is a hierarchical model. Um, and I think that's very important. And perhaps here's where things do start, where it starts to, um, at, at least in my mind, I start to see some of what's at stake. Um, I, I think that the more peripheral layers of the predictive model, I, I see the predictive model as a, as a, as not as a triangle, but rather as an onion. Uh, so the core uh, is the the deepest uh, layers of the model. That is to say, um, the the layers that have the um, the greatest um, uh, spatial. Uh, and temporal generalizability. Um, and they're the most stable layers of the model. And as we move toward the periphery, which coincides with the periphery um, of the of the nervous system, in other words, the encounter with the outside world, um, so it becomes more chaotic. We are able to, to we, we can tolerate um, more unpredictability at the periphery. Uh, and uh, we we're trying to and that's and that also allows for greater accuracy because the world is so unpredictable we have a more more chaotic uh, um outer layer of our predictive model where, where where things also there's less that's at stake you know is that car going to turn left or right well i thought it was going to turn left turn right so what doesn't matter you know but um is the law going to is the car going to obey the laws of gravity that that, that matters more you know that's not something uh, that uh, that's a, a, a much more consequential surprise uh, if it if it does not um and perhaps that's a, a silly uh, analogy but at least it illustrates the general point our most heartfelt beliefs um and um uh, that is to say the deepest la layers of our of our predictive hierarchy there uh, we find the same patterns over and again, and we 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 find ourselves we 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 are more certain um, of our predictions, and we act 
more stereotypically in accordance with them, uh, whereas uh, at the periphery, uh, th that does not apply. So I think um, at one point in your presentation, Alexi, you, you were saying something like, you know, one size doesn't fit all. It's not all just one mechanism all the way down. Uh, of course, I completely agree with that. Um, the, 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 it's not just one mechanism. And the different homeostats that you were referring to on their different scales are also serving different needs, you know, and there's, there's not a common currency. Uh, I, I think that's a very important part of, um, of how consciousness works, why we have qualia at all, is because we can't reduce things to a common currency. We're dealing with categorical variables, uh, it, 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 at the very least in relation to our bodily needs. They are categorically distinct needs and they need to be treated as such. And this is why we have different feelings in relation to these different uh, categories of, of free energy. So um, those are those are some of the main things um, I, I wanted to say, just to get the ball rolling. I'm mindful of the fact that Andrea Clerici uh, only has uh, 15 more minutes with us. So um, uh, maybe we can pick. I can pick up on some other points later. Uh, but at, at this stage, l let me hand over to Andrea. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, sorry. I will try also to articulate something of the very fascinating paper of, of Alex Haber. I must confess, since I'm also a psychoanalytic psychotherapist, a psychiatrist, it's not my field, I'm not a physicist, so I can really say a few words. Uh, some is of, as I said already, fascination, because in general, I hate to stick to rigid theories. So if uh, there is a paper like Alexei who can chaoticize my theories, even in psychoanalysis, uh, uh, in the workings of the mind and the brain, I'm happy to, 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 to dive into it. At the same time, uh, I, I, I don't have the skills to, to, to discuss the, the, the math part of this paper or even the, the, the physical formulas and so on. Uh, but I was reminded of a very early, and you, I think you all know that book, uh, Jacques Monod, Chance and Necessity, which is a, a classic. And I think it's a book in which you, uh, you can from from scratch, I mean here that we, our aim in the world, and I I I'm, I know I'm talk, I'm sounding uh, theological, but we have theological uh, mm, theological uh, aims uh, in order to stay alive. We have to face chance and chaos. So I think this is uh, in order to survive and reproduce. We have to. Uh, have a mathematical uh, system to reduce chaos and to bring up again determinism or psychic determinism. Since one of the of the points that uh, Alexei I think raised is, do can we can we still hold the point of Freud's about psychic determinism? And I think if you apply not to the physics of uh, of just materialism of uh, of of, uh, of things actually, but to the living organism, I think we do. I, this is my point, and I, I would like to uh, to hear what Alexei says. In the end, the chaos theory math mathematics. As far as I understand, it must be a mathematics who reduce chance or chaos to uh, to a linearity, at least in the in the living organism. And I and I wonder if and what Alexei thinks about it, because you seems to disagree with that. Want to give a direct response, Lexi, or? Then Bryn and Albert would be awesome to hear your takes as well. Some of the thoughts from Mark and from Andrea. Should I start by responding to Andrea's points or Mark's or? Yeah. 
maybe I'll start by, because I think the, the key point that Mark you brought up is what's at stake is still unclear. My impression is, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I was very influenced, Mark, by your paper. I forgot exactly the journal where you talked about psychiatry world, how these sort of, you know, convention-based diagnosis of here's a major depressive disorder, here's a bipolar disorder, nothing of which has to do with etiology, you know, uh, convention and statistics, you know. And then you brought up this, you know, revolutionary thing with effective neuroscience where you talked about the manic state and the depression state. And, you know, tied into the uh, punk subsystem, I think is extraordinary. But what I wanted to say is, you know, if we look at how we diagnose and think about what's happening, and we look at the language of how we do it, it is still a deterministic language at the end of the day. So when we moved from DSM-4 to DSM-5, we brilliantly discovered that continuous variables exist. We used to have buckets, everything was in a separate bucket, and then we said autism is a spectrum, and everybody applauded. But, you know, mathematicians were quietly laughing in the corner, you know, because, of course, continuous variables exist. And, you know, but we don't do dynamics. We're still very static. Here's this clear-cut thing, and this is the clear-cut continuous thing, right? And I, my impression, I may be wrong, is that even in, in our neuropsychoanalytic developments, we still do things deterministically. We assess which bucket things belong to, or maybe two buckets at the same time or three buckets. But we don't do things like, you know, how the chaotic systems are qualitatively different from static things. I'm quoting William Sulis. They have transience, they have contextuality, and they have emergence. We don't do that, you know. And uh, I think that if we embrace the chaos theory, if we do things like correlational dimension assessment or fractal dimension assessment, starting from this system of classification of emotions, there's still buckets. Here's a clear-cut thing called fear. And that's a clear-cut thing called rage, buckets, determinism, okay? And, you know, they look differently in the dynamical systems world. And then the system of psychopathology could look like, you know, correlational dimension changed and not that somebody fell into a bucket. You know, if we look at this complex, you know, landscape of attractors and repellers and examine psychodynamic things like, uh, please forgive me if I'm incorrect, uh, um, but one of the possible definitions of repression could be seen as not letting things into consciousness. Maybe we can call it suppression, but what I'm trying to say is, I don't want to think that right now, it hurts, it's a painful thing. That, in the, in the terminology that I shared, is a repeller. And perhaps when you work through things in a psychodynamic psychotherapy, perhaps you put a scar tissue on the wound, it becomes less of a sharp, you know, uh, repeller, and it smooths out. You know, we don't talk, we, we, we don't diagnose like that, we don't treat like that, we don't think like that. Uh, one paper that I'm working on that is in, in peer review right now, and I can't share too much, says that, you know, we think like storytellers. I'm quoting Daniel Kahneman. Our, our you know, think in mind of a clinician is not a statistician. We don't think in probabilities. We think in labels and we think in stories. And I know you had this powerful quote, Mark, from Freud, who said that that's the nature of the mind. And I most respectfully disagree that that's the entire nature of the mind. I do think that we have things on the mind that are not stories and not words. So if the nature of the phenomenon is chaotic and stochastic and periodic, then we can use appropriate mechanisms to diagnose and classify uh, that fits the, the nature of the model. The second thing you said, chaos and stochasticity, I absolutely agree with you that they're different. You know, on the chart that I've shown, if you converge to a stable from a group, uh, uh, chaos is deterministic, forward deterministic. So if initial conditions are changing, they will diverge, but you can predict things forward, not back. But uh, there is no formula in a stochastic thing. You know, you throw the coin, you don't know, you have no predictability whatsoever, short term or, or, or third or long term. So they are different. And in the sense that you're talking to sensitivity to initial conditions, this is music to my heart to hear you to say that you acknowledge that chaoticity clearly is present in the brain. On which level of the hierarchy in your model is a very important thing. But again, when we draw this picture, whether it's a triangle or an onion with a core and layers, it's a static model. And when you acknowledge that there's higher unpredictability toward the periphery, it could be, but there could be dynamics about the structure of the model. And perhaps what you're saying is survival, you know, like I must breathe and I must breathe air and I'm not in the water. And that is a very stable prediction. Absolutely. But when we deal with psychopathology and we deal with things like shame and pride and awe and other things, then uh, I wonder if we should continue to use this 
metaphor of a homeostat. I really don't see how homeostat applies to gamma rhythm in the brain or to shame. Uh, so an homeostat is, is the convergent systems so that you, you minimize entropy by keeping things in the range. However, if you dive inside the homeostat, if you look at the temperature variation inside our narrow range, you may see chaos, which is exactly the picture that I saw. So um, that, that I showed. Um, and to Andrea's point is about the Freud's principle of psychic determinism. Yes, I almost think that we haven't said goodbye to that. We haven't tried to say that chance exists in the mental life. Accidents exist. We don't do that. There's a firm tradition in, in psychoanalytic psychotherapy to say there's no accidents. It's all determined. That's a major key point of the discussion. I don't know if I said too much. Maybe Andrea, if you want to give any yes, thoughts or, or how do you how do you want things to continue in the coming minutes and years? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, just adding a word that I didn't use because I think it's very important about trying to defend the point about psychic determinism, which I'm, I'm very fond of. I mean, the word is adaptation. I have difficulties in, because when you see a psychotic patient, when you see a borderline patient, well, I don't see chaos or total unpredictability. I think the adaptation, their uh, disruptions, uh, I, I try to, 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 to understand what are the, even the, ma the, mathemat the mathematical part be behind that, in my opinion, has to have a, a, a tendency toward an order which is adaptive. In this way, I see uh, the, the, the mathematical part of, of chaos may be of use. I mean, but bringing uh, to an explanation, not to a, maybe not to an order or to a determinism, but to uh, a point in which uh, there must be this adaptive reason, even in the chaos. Do you see my point? I do, but I think that there's a deeper issue about how we think. You know, say there's a clinician, psychoanalytic psychotherapist, we have a working memory and the Miller's law that Mark, you quote a lot about the seven units of information uh, in the audio-verbal working memory. I think in the Miller's paper, he actually said seven chunks. So I'm, I'm sharing something from the paper in review right now. We cannot think probabilistically because it overloads the working memory. This is why when I'm a clinician, I think about psychosis, I come up with a story, a formulation that fits in the working memory. And this influences our work. We don't have the mathematics in here to think in the terms of probabilistic things and chaos theory and other things. We need tools to do that. And in mainstream neurology, they use tools. They do talk to the patient that examined the patient, but they have MRI, they have EHG, they have PESCAN and all the other things. In psychoanalytic psychotherapy, we say we don't need any tools. We just talk to a person and that is sufficient for everything we do. But that's not necessarily true. Beatrice Beebe who is a psychoanalyst, works with a mother-infant diet, and there's zero words exchanged, zilch. But she looks at this movie that she records on a video camera, and then she throws it, shows it in a slow motion. So she takes a flow, which is dynamic flow, not words, not discrete things, and then she slows it down, and she shows the level of attunement between the mother and the child. We don't do things like that. We talk. And we use this deterministic things to understand the psychopathology of the patients. And that's psychosis, and that's schizophrenia, and that is bipolar one. And this is panic system, and this is seeking system. We determinize everything. And that is a limitation. Because inside, I believe, what is a fear cascade? How does fear start? It's a flow. It's a turbulent thing. And we put one label on it, say fear. We've classified it. So for some things, it's appropriate. But for some things, it may not be. It may be, you know, as, as you know, Einstein said, as Mark, you quoted Einstein, as simple as possible, but not simpler than that. So at which point we are missing, we're missing the phenomenon by using deterministic tools in our work. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel and Mark, to everyone. Thank you. I have to go. Thanks. Awesome. So Albert and then Bryn and we'll continue on this topic. Um. Yeah, thank you for uh, the presentation and the very interesting discussion so far. Um, one thing that comes to mind is the um, 
the the well the thing we're talking about right now the psychic determinism as as uh, depicted as being a, fa a foundational law in psychoanalysis um well i'm thinking about the authors the psychoanalytic authors who came the prominent ones who came after freud uh who seem to have uh uh who, ha who have room for this this chaos maybe they didn't use this term sp uh, ex explicitly but i'm thinking for example wilfred Bion who's got the notion of the O layer, um, which has connotations of, uh, well, the thing that, that cannot be known or categorized, who has like in, indeterminate elements of the mind. And that's one of his major contributions, contributions to psychoanalysis. And on the other hand, more the French schools, I'm thinking of Jacques Lacan, who's got the notion of the real, which is also one of his major contributions, contributions to psychoanalysis, where notions of rupture, of absence, or of lack are very prominent. I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not an expert here, but I think Lacan explicitly uh, challenges the notion of Freud's mechanistic worldview in one of his seminars. So I'm wondering what you think about this, uh, Alexei. I'm not an expert in Lacan at all, and I know Wilfred Bion uh, in a limited fashion, so perhaps Mark uh, is a better person to 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 uh, to talk, and I I, I like Freud, uh, particularly in Mark's interpretations and translations. But maybe Mark can comment on Lacan and beyond. I I'm not sufficiently knowledgeable about their work. If you want to, Mark or Bryn, you can share some thoughts. Yeah, please. Um, well, I, I think that uh, um, the the point that Albert's making that is we must remember that psychoanalysis is not synonymous with Freud, um, that not everything in psychoanalysis uh, stands or falls by whether or not we accept this or that tenet of Freud's. Um, and uh, in neuropsychoanalysis, we try very much to draw upon uh, all of the traditions uh, within psychoanalysis uh, and we we, we sort of uh, uh, fondly believe that we'll be able to find more a common ground uh, because there are greater empirical tools available in neuropsychoanalysis than in psychoanalysis by itself you know we're, we're, we are hoping to resolve some of these uh, theoretical disagreements trying to move beyond just different systems of belief trying to move more toward uh, a a psychoanalysis in which we can decide questions in an ordinary scientific way but it will always be very difficult for exactly the reason uh, that alexi's whole talk is about i suppose which is you know the 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 ex extreme complexity uh, and therefore um unpredictability uh, of the of the phenomena that we are dealing with um so uh, I think uh, Albert's points are valid, uh, that uh, the um, Beyond's uh, approach, uh, Lacan's approach, um, they, they, add, they add a great deal. They, 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 uh, they don't, uh, they don't um, have as much to, to lose uh, if we throw out the principle of psychical determinism. Um, but having said that, let me just quickly say a word about psychical determinism, because this has been a, a big part of what uh, Andrea uh, uh, picked up on, on on in what uh, Alexi said. Um, I, I, I think it comes down to uh, the, the the question that I asked at the outset. It's not a matter of uh, is the behavior of the mind random, uh, or uh, it's it's a it's a question of how predictable. Uh, uh, it, it's not a matter of is there no determinism. It's a matter of how easily can we trace effects back to their causes. Um, so the fact that there's a great deal that goes on where we can't do that. Uh, there are many things our patients say, whether they be slips of the tongue or anything else of that kind, and not only to do with parapraxies, but anything that they do. You know, there's certain things that we see with regularity. I mean, the very phenomenon of transference is all about regularities, uh, that there's certain things that we see, yep, this I, this I, this I, I can understand. Um, th 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 this happens uh, uh, repeatedly. Uh, I, 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 I think I can explain that with reference to uh, certain aspects of the patient's inner world and, and their past. 
but there's a great deal else that we can't. So I don't think that it's a kind of, you know, either there's determinism or there's or there's uh, statisticity. I think that there's this is why I was talking also about the layers of the predictive hierarchy. That the the deeper layers are the unconscious ones. Their things are pretty pretty stereotyped, um, pretty pretty predictable. In fact. Uh, 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 too predictable. I mean, in other words, it overgeneralizes. It 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 it's it's too confident about its beliefs. Um, but as we head toward uh, the pre-conscious and conscious peripheries, you know, there things are much less predictable. Um, so that that's uh, I, I won't say more. Uh, there's a couple of things in what uh, Alexei said in his uh, in his comments after mine. That that if we have time, I'll come back to. But I I think let's rather hear from from Bryn before I, I say anything more. Yeah, thank thank you so much. Um, I I I'm perhaps the least qualified here to to comment on your on your paper, uh, Alexi. Um, but I do have one or two thoughts, and they they come from a place of being very fortunate uh, thus far in my life to have been a patient. For, for many many hours um um uh, sometimes on the couch uh, and also to be a, a clinical psychologist I, I failed to mention that at the at the in my introduction so I, i'm i'm a clinician i was uh, uh, until recently uh, when my foray began into more um research based areas and by the active uh, inference uh, institute and mark's work and uh, and, and 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 Carl Friston's work. I was a, a a pure clinician. I had it in my mind that I was going to treat psychopathology to the best of my ability. Um, but really, it was being a patient first and foremost that brought me into closer contact with the the theme of your paper and certainly the themes uh, of Mark's uh, work. Um, and um. I think I've encountered it from both areas, uh, and it certainly uh, um, it matters to to, uh, to my mind. It matters less the inner workings of uh, the degree to which uh, chaos, uh, uh, stochastic, uh, all these big wonderful terms that that I'm only beginning to to even uh, think about, but. Um, uh, what what's what matters to me is that how do you help somebody uh who is in a in a state who comes in disheveled and 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 you know how does one go about helping uh aiding somebody in that state um i um fell out of love with psychoanalysis uh for 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 personal reasons um but it was in returning to it, I, I've become more kind of a better acquainted with its uh, strengths and its limitations, uh, and I'm realizing that it, um, it, it's that when you help somebody and manage to reduce the noise, to reduce uh, the chaos in somebody's mind, um, that they, that when they become the greater degrees of health, start returning to them. That they they do rely far more, whether they know it or not, on probabilistic reasoning in their daily um, kind of functioning, um, and so I think there is a strong case to be made for um, a mathematical uh, uh, way of processing the world. Uh, it doesn't have to necessarily be conscious, uh, made conscious to the person. Um, it can be a bit overwhelming to. Uh, uh to try and impart that uh, on somebody but um i think a brain that is not working properly uh regardless of the degree to which there is chaos uh that can be measured or quantifiably uh, uh measured in that brain uh, somebody is is tripping over themselves because they um they they are unable to predict what might happen and and that is a terrifying prospect because i think there is a some reliance and some uh, some staunch dependability on the the fact that the sun is going to rise and that it's going to set and that i can then focus on other things uh um so that's just the my comments more from kind of a personal front of being a a, a patient 
and and encountering the limitations of psychotherapy and what what I would have what I would have done in those moments of need to have not, as you say, had a, a more a deterministic view of what was happening. Uh, and I've tried to um, transfer that or carry that over, rightly or wrongly, um, into my own therapy as a, as, as a psychotherapist. As, as, um, um, so a more personal thing of what it means to be, feel chaotic and what I see, regardless of how confirmed it is, um, it, you know, or, or not. Um, but but chaos reigns and, and it's to try and not compound that. Uh, is certainly something that um, I, I'm, I'm interested in. So, yeah. Thank you, Bryn. I'll also give my thought on what's at stake and what's on the table as a total non-clinician, but what I saw in Alexis' paper and also what I see people coming towards. I see the paper as Alexi making a, a real stable of concepts or portfolio of topics ranging from the first principles of active inference, like surprise bounding, to dynamic, stochastic, chaotic, which are not the same thing, but they sometimes cohabitate. So bringing a set of concepts into play, making it matter for the field, so that it can matter for the clinician, so that it can matter for the patient, which is where you totally brought it home to, Bryn. And in my totally simplified model, I was seeing all this diagnostic machinery from personalized data, EEG recordings, all these surveys and samples, all the different conversation therapy itself, all these different measurements, inference, and then it passes through the Markov blanket of the diagnosis. And it's like, well, now we know that that person is X or they have X. And then here's where we now branch back out with uh, modalities of, of treatment. And so that bottlenecking has obvious relevance in terms of like getting a categorical grip on what we basically all agree are wetware, complex systems, they're sensitive to initial conditions, all of that. And what if though, like you brought up the example with the scar tissue, maybe it's literal bodily scar tissue, maybe it's conceptual scar tissue. What if that inference were able to be understood in the context of an attractor landscape. And it's not just a singular attractor. So we have multiple attractors. We have a chaotic landscape. And so what if we were able to um, perforate that blanket, speaking super loosely, to bring in what we have already recognized as diagnostically relevant, like the fact that Patients who have differential entropy have this or that epileptic outcome or coma outcome bring in that machinery that led to the diagnosis, but now take it beyond the diagnosis and maybe even beyond the clinician's concept directly into the hands of the patient. Thank you so much. Perhaps we can hear from Mark. And uh, yeah, I, I am not eager to talk. I'll, if there is time, I'll say something. But if not, that's okay. Um, well, let me first of all say something about my uh, um, screen. Uh, you might, some of you have noticed that suddenly everything went black behind me. Uh, that's because I have, I'm in South Africa where they have power problems. Uh, and then um, a kind person in my household thought that they would help and they've put this huge spotlight here, which is shining in my eyes. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, um, if 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 I if I look as if I'm in, in the, the, a rabbit in headlights, it's because I am. I sent a text message saying, "Please come and remove this big lamp you put here," but they don't seem to have received the message. Um, now back to our our actual uh, topic. Um, to the extent that I'm able to not be distracted from it. I think that um, the, when I asked um, uh, Alexi what was at stake, um, his main answer uh, was to do with a diagnosis. Now, I don't mean that he's saying that that's all that's at stake, but I think he's saying this illustrates what's at stake. Um, so I want to, first of all, make sure that, because uh, I'm not sure who, who our audience is and who's going to be watching this, uh, in case anybody uh, is, uh, misunderstands uh, 
uh, I want to make clear that in psychoanalysis, um, we've long ago moved away from DSM and ICD type diagnosis. Uh, we 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 always thought that um, the 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 nosology uh, the, the the psychiatric nosology was was wholly uh, uh, artificial um, and created uh, divisions where they don't exist in nature, uh, and we replaced it with a far more dynamic uh, approach to diagnosis. And that's not just a matter of labeling. It's a matter also of what kind of thought process lies behind the diagnosis. In other words, conceptualizing what's going on here, uh, rather than saying this is a an instance of personality disorder, uh, and I'll specify which type. You know, we don't think like that in psychoanalysis, and 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 really, we never have. Um, in neuropsychoanalysis, uh, the the we 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 build in that same tradition. Um, I think that what Alexi was. Uh, was worrying about he's, he's he's saying yeah but uh, you know you use you use systems uh, you 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 say that there's this very that there's a certain number of drives um, and you use those to pass what you're seeing clinically and uh, yes we do um, and we have to because you can't just say what I'm seeing is chaos you know what you've got to say is well what I'm seeing is chaos but let me try my best to find the deeper structure of this. Uh, and so what we do is much the same as what I was saying earlier about how brain and mind work. Likewise, the clinician's mind works that way. We have some deeper concepts uh, that organize what we see. Uh, and then uh, more on the surface, uh, we, 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 we see uh, the, the complexity. You know, In other words, we don't think that we can reduce a patient just to uh, one saying this patient has problems with this drive or something. It's not as simple as that, of course, but we do start with saying, well, these are the drives. These are the attractors, uh, uh, to put it uh, uh, in terms of the attractor landscape that you're talking about. These are the, these are the preferred states um, of the of the human phenotype, you know, and, the, and, and in mental life too, they are preferred states. There are certain, there's certain attractors uh, that, that we're trying to um, uh, uh, stay in those in those um, like for example uh, uh, fear we want to be safe we don't want to feel fear uh, you know with respect to attachment bonding we want to stay close to our uh, to our attachment figures we don't want to lose them uh, with respect to rage we, we we don't want to be frustrated and have things standing in our way we want to we want to be able to have free access to the objects of our needs and so on you know, those are these attractors. And, you know, we, we have great difficulty staying in those, in those homeostatic bounds. And, uh, so, you know, it's a, it is a dynamic, uh, a picture. And then it's a uh, over, over the question of the, of the different drives. There's the, the highly individualized predictive model that each one of us comes up with, uh, in relation to those drives and in relation to the conflicts between those drives and so on. So I think that um th this way of thinking that we use uh, in psychoanalysis and neuropsychoanalysis is already of the kind that Alexi is calling for so i think that what daniel's just said is that therefore perhaps uh, very important to be make clear uh, it's that that he's offering us a language an additional language uh, an additional i don't just mean language i should say an additional set of concepts uh, and um, and a, a highly developed one, uh, which we might find useful. And so we should take this on board. That sounds very convincing to me. Uh, if if that's what's at stake here, that, that Alex is saying, this is a language that lends itself to the phenomena that you study and to the way in which you go about studying it, then it sounds to me as if Alex is right. Um, so that's the main uh, thing I wanted to say in response to to his comments uh, 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 in, in, in relation to what I said. Um, so uh, if anyone else wants to say anything else, that's that's good f f with me. But uh, Alexi, uh, if, if I've misunderstood and if there's something else that you think is at stake that I'm not getting, now's your chance to, to, to say it. Well, I, I just wanted to, to end the conversation when you said that, that if this language might be of any 
even to consider this language to to in our future models. I'm a happy man, and uh, there's nothing else I need to say. Uh, and um, I just wanted to to say that these are human things. They're occupational hazards. Some of the things I'm talking about. This paper I'm working on about narrative stuff is that you know uh, of course you know it is much easier for us to think in in uh, categories. Now even in the psychoanalytic world, you know what what uh, you know we do. In, in the old, let's take the McWilliam system and the previous one, we used to say three levels of functioning, you know, uh, neurotic, borderline, psychotic. These are categories. They're not DSM categories. They're not bipolar one, but they're categories nonetheless. And then we have character styles, obsessive character style, histrionic character style. They're categories, okay? So to some degree, it's a human condition to put things in categories. And I do think that this is, this is a very strong historical reasons that we think this way. We 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 this, we we're, we have generations of thinking this way in categories. And yes, at the end of the day, when we paint a portrait of a patient, it's developed and it's like a tapestry. All of these things weave into one another, and it's complex. But we start from basic categories, and you know, um, certainly if we consider that, you know, so, some things can be transient. There can be emergence. There, like that, the certain behavior in one context is a uh, compulsion. But it's not a compulsion in another context, and perhaps I'm saying trivial things to clinician and to clinicians. And uh, also, what 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 Brian you said, just to comment, when you said as a patient to reduce the noise and reduce the chaos, I detect the bias in the language. You see how we call you know psychopathology in DSM disorders. Disorder is a bad word for us, and I'm trying to say chaos is healthy. I spend most of my day in gamma functioning, which is a chaotic state. It's not a bad yes. thing. So in the folk language, chaos is a bad word. Disorder is a bad. I want to put things in order. And then perhaps we're missing something. What comes to mind is, I think, Mark, you had meetings with Michael Levin and Ian McGilchrist, who is you know, big on talking about the mechanistic, you know, logical, linear, straight and narrow left hemisphere type. Of course, it's not left hemisphere, but that's the model versus holistic, sensorial kind of right hemisphere artistic type. And we're missing the second part, like Daniel's background is surrounded by art, where you know we 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 spend less time in the right hemisphere. <laughs> maybe maybe appropriately so, but I think that there's some things that lend themselves to that level of understanding. And we, we break things we 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 look at psychopathology and a human suffering like it's a carburetor sometimes. Where, where we again, you know, put it in buckets. That's my impression. But what you said uh, is is wonderful, and I I you know I don't contradict with anything. I agree with everything you said, Mark. So, uh, Alex, if I can just um, comment, uh, if, you know, the, if I, if it's almost like an arc, uh, you know, the the pot of gold at the end of the arc is is the uh, reduced chaos, the reduced noise in terms of the patients from the patient's perspective. But how you get there, ironically, is actually by inducing um, um, uh, states of uh, tolerable chaos um, and then kind of re reformulating that, reconsolidating that chaos. Um, so it's not that a, that from the, you know, healing or growth or whatever the patient might present to you for, uh, it has everything to do with um, minimal or marginal chaos induction and then, in, um, you know, reintegration of that. So it, the whole process is is premised on chaos, but in bite-sized doses, maybe one could, could say. Right. So, and yeah. just to finish up and then I'll stop talking. Jonathan Shadler, who is, you all know, and is, uh, you know, widely uh, respected as a psychoanalytic practitioner and teacher and writer, uh, he recently said that take a patient X with an analyst Y, together the diet has emergent properties. That is not the same thing as patient X with the analyst Z, right? And show me one study where we, we take that into account. We don't. We just we just do random you know a clinical trial. Then we do meta analysis of random clinical trial. What technique did the therapist use? They used you know whatever four letter therapy they applied. Nobody looks at the emergent properties in a diet. The this matrix you know between the two, and that's the language of dynamical systems. This is Daniel Friedman. You know ant colony. Uh, you know a single ant doesn't build bridges and grow mushrooms. Ant colony does all those things. We don't talk about emergence in psychoanalytic psychotherapy, do we? It's true. It's also a fundamental yeah. challenge 
after all, you can't replicate within one dyad or across dyads in a finite world. So, so it does point to fundamentals. In our last minutes, if um, each would like to give some thoughts, where do we go as we now the open of exponent away from each other in our paths? So maybe um, Albert, Bryn, Mark, and then Alexi. What are your overall thoughts or reflections? And then where are we heading? Go for it, Albert. Um, yeah, I was, I was, I was about to comment on Alexi um, about the emergent properties thing. Um, it's, 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 it's kind of the, the same point I made earlier. Um, and, and later psychoanalytic theories do talk about emergent properties. Um, but yes, I think as, as what, what Professor Solz just mentioned, uh, this, this, this language, I mean, this, this new set of concepts makes it very, uh, practical for us to communicate, uh, with each other because psychoanalysis has a bad habit of reinventing new uh, concepts every, every new decade. So it's, there's a lot of chaos to use that word, um, within, uh, psychoanalytic, uh, discourse. So yeah, uh, but overall, I thought I'm very grateful. I think this was a very interesting talk. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes. So uh, uh, by by way of closing uh, remarks, I I, I uh, agree with. Um, actually, it seems to me that there's there's a there's an abundance of agreement in this meeting. I I, I don't see uh, any big controversy. Um, so uh, that's nice. Um, the uh, I think what Bryn said uh, is really captures it. I liked it because it because what he said was so experience near. You know, he was just describing what it feels like to be a patient and 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 uh, uh, you know uh, to be in a state of un not knowing uh, uh, and uncertainty uh, as opposed to you know a more stable kind of. Uh, Tranquility and then the 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 ability to uh, to to uh, uh, allow yourself to return to uncertainty um, if you've if you've um, found uh, answers that are too simple and that that are that are too um, static uh, to allow ourselves to go back into this state of of, of not really knowing. Um, that that's that I think really does describe what what we try to do for our patients. What we have to remember applies to ourselves, not only because we are uh, ultimately patients too, but because it applies to the, how the mind works. It applies to science, how science works. You know that we 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 do need to find order, uh, but. Uh, there is disorder out there, and so we're always uh, at risk of coming prematurely to a rigid system of belief, um, and uh, we have to return back to the cold face and back to the chaos. Uh, but ultimately, where we want to be uh, is back in in that valley. Uh, uh, where, where, um, uh, and uh, so, the as much as uh, Alex is right to um, remind us that. Uh, at the uh, that the, the 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 highest levels of brain activity um, in many senses of the word uh, are entropic, um, and the, that deep sleep and seizures, you know, are 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 bad things. Uh, uh, you know, that, as much as that's true, nevertheless, I think that the great trend of the mind—it's it's it's one of its fundamental working principles. Is we're we're wanting to be more certain. To, we want life to be more predictable. We don't like to be in chaos, um, and I think that that's an important um, uh, uh, thing to remember. You know, while we are acknowledging the importance uh, of, of of chaos and 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 of the the highly unpredictable nature of of the world and of the phenomena we study in our field, nevertheless we retreat from it, um, and and for very good reasons. So those are my closing remarks, uh, and and thank you. And uh, I'll be very brief, uh, Alexia. Yeah, just thank you for the paper and and uh, uh, for uh, having such a um, strong focus on the patient and on psychopath. Well, on on human 
the human condition. I, I think that's so nice to have that um, come out uh, of the paper when at, at, at first glance, it doesn't seem to be there. So thanks for making it so human. And, and then just uh, Daniel for organizing and, and to uh, spend time with Mark and, and Albert. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great pleasure. So thank you very much. Alexi, final words? Oh, I want to thank everybody and Mark and Bryn and Albert and Daniel and Andrea. Thank you. This is, I had a, a great fun and I'm um, very grateful, honestly, for your uh, help and openness and flexibility. One of the other reasons is uh, kind of the, the time we live in. Yuval Harari made that comment that the rate of change is accelerating. You know, when we were hunter gatherers, uncertainty was norm. You wake up, there's nothing in the fridge. You have to go hunt. And we tolerated uncertainty better. We could put our worldly possessions on the back. And then we started living in the world of iPads, iPhones, we're bombarded with information. And we must minimize uncertainty. We must, you know, have predictability in everything, which is not the natural world for mammals. And now, you know, we live our life and then bang, COVID hits. And then bang, you know, a certain person becomes the president of the United States, you know, and everything goes upside down. So uh, the black swans are hitting us more frequently. So I think having the theory of that, you know, at our fingerprints and applying it to our work is probably, you know, beneficial. But again, thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Well, thank you all for joining. The conversation continues. So till next time. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.